Today we're making a hydromel. Welcome to the Four Seasons. I'm your host, Ken Johnson. And before we get started with this video, I'm just going to let you know how this video has progressed. Originally, I was just doing this to enter into a meat contest. I had no reason really other than just entering the contest as something fun to do. And I guess I was bored. So anyway, I entered it. The contest is over with, but I decided that I liked the idea of the hydromel so much as a teaching base that I would do a series on how to make mead using the hydromel as a cheap and easy way to make meads. And so with this hydromel, I use gallberry honey. And the reason why I use gallberry honey is that it has certain flavors which are reminiscent of beer. And a lot of people say that hydromel is closest to a beer. So I decided I'd go ahead and make this hydromel using something that already has beer flavors and use it as a way to show how the honey is supposed to enhance certain flavors. And because a lot of these mead channels on YouTube, they'll say stupid stuff like just use any honey or they'll say, well, you know, I'm using a clover honey, or I'm using Walmart honey, or I'm using wildflower honey because I don't want something to distract from the other flavor I'm making in my wine. And that's the problem. They're trying to make wine or beer or whatever, and they're not actually trying to make mead. Because they've added honey, they think that's all you need to do in order to have a mead. But the purpose behind a mead is that the honey should be doing something. It should be doing more than providing alcohol, which is fermentable sugars. It needs to be pr producing flavors, accentuating flavors, um, you know, trying to take flavors to a next level or to add complexity. There's a whole host of things that honeys can do in a wine or in a mead, but if you're just trying to make a wine and you're trying to use Walmart honey or clover honey or, you know, wildflower honey or something just because, you know, you want to call it mead, you're doing a disservice to your viewers. And I really don't want to do that. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm using very complicated type of honey varietal gallberry, which has some malty notes and bitter notes and all these different notes that you get from beer. And to show how it accentuates or even sometimes may even detract from certain flavors so that you understand, okay, I need this honey varietal for this thing or that thing or whatever, because I'm hoping that you will follow along with me. And so before this video starts, you need to know that I plan to do about 12 to 13 different meads, including this Hydra Mel. And I'm using the Hydra, which is a mythological creature, as kind of symbolism for this brew. So in every single mead that I make in this Hydra Mel series, I'm thinking of it like a Hydra. And so Mel is the first Hydra. And then once we drink this one um, in this video and do a testing, then we'll go to the next. And so, at like a hydra, new heads rise. So that, and what I'll do is I'll use anywhere between a half gallon and a gallon of the hydromel as the base starter. This is to ensure that we've got, you know, the gallberry honey, the right amount of gallberry honey, 
the same yeast. So I'm just reusing the same yeast that I made with my base hydromel in all these so that it's got the same yeast. And um, so what you'll need to do if you're following along, I would recommend that you create, you can buy, but you can also create, and I, I think it's better just to create two five gallon fermenters. And so you need to do eight gallons, eight to nine gallons of this hydromel recipe. And that's because, again, a half gallon to a gallon is going to be used as the starter. So I will not be breaking out individual packets and everything like I normally do. We're just going to use that as the starter and then we'll be adding more uh, gallberry honey as we progress. Now I will state as of recording this video I've already got a few ready and some are still in the process and some have not been brewed yet because this is the first and then I've, I've still got to do work. I'm still producing content. So one of the problems I ran into is that I use Crystal Springs spring water as my water. And I also use the jug as my fermenters. Well, we can't get Crystal Springs anymore. I don't know what happened with that company, but I cannot get it anymore. Another thing is that the apiary I use they are not producing the gallberry honey. So I've had to switch midstream providers of gallberry honey, and so that's gonna provide different notes. So if you're gonna be doing this, expect to spend uh, somewhere around three to $400 on this project. And you need to make sure that you have sufficient honey. So you think about it, you need you know, you'll, you'll need all the, the honey to replicate eight to nine gallons of the base. And then I'm putting roughly about a half pound in most of my recipes of gallberry honey. So you'll need to calculate how much gallberry honey you need to do. You'll also need to figure out how much water you need to provide and get all that stuff because of the shortages in the supply chain right now that we're going through in our country. So just be aware of that, that it, you know, if you don't go ahead and get it now, it could be extremely difficult. And you don't have to use gallberry honey if you can't find it, but I'm hoping that you will do it with gallberry honey and then later do the same thing with maybe Tupelo honey or avocado honey or buckwheat honey or blueberry honey or apple honey or whatever varietal that you want to try. And the reason for that is that this is a cheap and easy way of trying out and experimenting. Whereas a regular mead recipe, you're looking $20, $30 for a gallon. Uh, this right here, you're looking at about eh, maybe $10 a gallon, sometimes less. So it's cheap, comparably. And also the fermentation time is normally two weeks versus three or four weeks. And it's meant to be drunk new. So that's the other thing. You can produce it very quickly, fairly inexpensively, get the information you need and start learning the basics of quality mead making, not this garbage you're seeing on YouTube channels where they say any honey works, any varietal works, all that stuff. No, variety matters. There's a reason why you use certain honeys you need to know what that honey is doing to the adjunct or group that you're adding. So if you're doing a sicer, some people say sicer, that's apple juice, then you need to know how's it going to impact that. If you're doing a piment, which is grape juice, you need to know how it impacts that. Uh, if you want to learn how to do a metheglin, or as some people say methaglin, then that's a spiced mead originally is meant for medicine 
um, and so you need to know what spices you're going to use and how that varietal is going to impact those flavors. So you have to choose wisely. Again, um, a braggot, which is basically the grandfather, or actually great-great-grandfather, of beer and ale. Okay? Now, it, you'll see a lot of YouTubers say uh, that they add hops. They're making a beer at that point in time. I'll explain that to you as well. So there's a lot of wrong information out there on YouTube. I'm going to try to dispel a lot of the myths and a lot of the bad information as I can. But if you ever have any questions, comment down below and I'll be happy to help you out. From that, let's continue on with the video. We're going to make the world's simplest mead, which means that it is the world's easiest mead to screw up. So I've got a half gallon of water, spring water. I've got a pound of gallberry honey from Larry Gillies farm. He's out in Chipley. So it's a Florida farm. I've got some Flashman's uh, Active Dry Yeast, the original. And now I've got some Walmart brand Active Dry Yeast. What's this bowl for? Basically what I'm gonna do is I'm going to pour in a little hot water. Don't have to be a lot, just a little bit. So next we're gonna add in this to the pitcher, okay? This will go into the boiling hot water. Now you're probably wondering why I'm doing that. Well, because yeast are carnivorous and I want a yeast nutrient. And so this will kill the yeast and then the bread yeast will feed off of this. Next, I'm going to go ahead and open up this container and pour the honey into the jug. I have gone to now four stores and cannot find a funnel and we lost one in the move to my house. I lost a few brews and I lost some of my brewing equipment. It was destroyed, crushed, all sorts of stuff. Plus my wife had a bottle of homemade champagne that blew up in her car. So yeah, Florida heat, bottles moving, that was not good. Anywho. I'll show you this after I pour in the honey. Okay, so now I'm going to cap it up and I'm going to shake it very well to incorporate this honey. Okay, the honey is incorporated into this and now I'm going to pour in the yeast nutrient. The yeast nutrient has been added, now I'm going to add in uh, water to the fill line. Alright, so I have done a reading it's hard to see through this opaque thing right here but it is 1.032 doing the calculations we're looking at about a four percent alcohol by volume so um i did 1.32 minus 1 because I think it'll finish out at 1 and then I multiply by 131.25 normally I do 133 but on that one I'm going to do 131.25 a lot of people say that at anything below 8% 131.25 is more accurate um, I've always used 133 um, so that that you know it's a personal preference, it's a guess is all it is. Next step in this is we're just going to pitch in our bread yeast. I'm using a whole packet. I always say you can you can always under pitch but it's almost impossible to over pitch. And um, so pitching just means tossing in your bread yeast. You don't need to hydrate it. 
I didn't hydrate this. People are going to say, oh, Ken, you use bread yeast. You're using some hick method. You know, you should have used a wine yeast. You should have used an ale yeast. All that good stuff. First and foremost, all yeasts are the same species. Think of them like humans. We're homo sapiens. Now you have all different races and ethnicities and everything else, and we're very diverse, but we're all homo sapiens. Same thing with yeast. It is all the same. Now you have some that are better suited to some things than others, and I will admit to that. And then, I think the people that they believe in all this, that you know everything is best suited, to one thing or another, they will concede you can get a packet and it not do what it's supposed to do because yeast can't read. They don't know that they're supposed to be a wine yeast or a bread yeast or whatever and all yeast basically do the same thing. I have found, and again I'm using a journalization, that Flashman's, they they tend to produce a good solid ferment and they preserve the flavor better than any wine yeast. Most wine yeasts will actually uh, strip off flavors. I've had that happen numerous times and the higher the ABV it can produce, the more it tends to strip off. So like a champagne yeast, it strips off a ton of flavors. So um, this is going to be low ABV. I want to keep as much flavor as possible. And so I'm going to use a bread yeast. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cap this. I'm going to shake it. And then you'll see me put on the balloon. We'll go from there. So my airlock is fairly easy. What I did is I just took a regular toy balloon. It's been sanitized. I don't use star sand or one step. I use bleach water. Um, I've had numerous videos on why I don't believe in using star sand or one step or any of those other acid based. But I just poke a few holes in the tip and then I take a piece of twine or string or whatever and I wrap it around it. I write on my jug what it is. This is a gallberry hydromel. I put the day's date. Today is Friday 13th. And my original gravity, 1.032. Let me put OG there too, just to be safe. I always like to do um, OG at the end just to let me know that was the starting gravity. On the side, I put my recipe. In this case, I use some water pound of gallberry honey and two packets of bread yeast. Fairly simple. Now, in other parts of the world, hydromel just refers to any mead because it is basically honey added with water so that the honey will ferment. Um, but that's the exception, not the rule. The rest of the world globally considers a hydromel to be anything that is under a certain percentage of honey to fermentable or for non-fermentable water or non-fermentable liquid so in this case one gallon of water more or less and one pound of honey would make this technically a hydromel now hydromels ferment off really quickly and they're meant to be drank very quickly because um, doing low alcohol means that you can get acetobacters in and that will turn it to vinegar. Anything under 10%, usually about 8 or below, you can get acetobacters. So this would be almost cider level alcohol or beer level in some countries, not in America. Most, most American states have beers over this alcohol content. But um, definitely in some areas of the world, this would be considered to be a beer. So I'm going to let this sit and we're going to show you when it's fermented out. And then I'm going to show you how I carbonate this.
just a mere matter of hours later and we have an active fermentation. The day is here and we're going to be racking and bottling our gallberry hydromel. So this finished off a few weeks ago. Um, I just didn't get a chance to, uh, to do anything with it except cold rack it, which a lot of people call cold crashing. But I consider cold racking to be more appropriate because you're basically racking on the sediment. And that, that actually causes it to cold filter. So I started this on the 13th. It is now June 2nd. It probably finished out about a week and a half ago. So this is our recipe. Water. I'm using a one gallon container. A pound of gallberry honey. And two packets of bread yeast. So one packet was boiled and added to the water to be yeast nutrient and the other packet was used to ferment. So first thing we're going to do is take off our balloon and then as we take off our balloon then we'll go to the next step. Okay. First thing I want to make mention of is this right here is like crystal clear. It has settled out beautifully. And I've got my new handy dandy auto siphon so you can just do a few pumps but because I'm having to hold this camera by hand, I'm going to do this off camera but you'll do a few pumps and then you've got to have something down low so I'm using my kitchen sink and a bucket or a or mixing bowl that's got some graduated numbers on so I know how much liquid I have so I know how many bottles I can fill with this. This right here is part takes forever. You can see how slowly it goes. If you had a little bit more height that helps some but really and truly it don't help that much. It just takes forever. I just wanted to show you that this is crystal clear. The you can tell that's clouded plastic, but inside, that right there is clear, clear, clear. So it is fermented out to 1.000. So now we're going to do a little taste test and figure out what we're going to do with the rest of this. Okay, I've done a taste test of this and it needs some help. So first thing we're going to do is add some sweetener. My preferred method for when I'm going to be bottling something, I don't want fermentable sugars, I'm now using erythritol. And really and truly, there's no measurement, it's to taste. So what I'll probably do is I'll use a few tablespoons at a time, taste it and see what I get. And if I like it, that's what I'll use. Okay, so I added eight tablespoons, and these are this is U.S. tablespoons of erythritol. So erythritol, if you ever looked at it, one and third cups is equal, equal to one cup of sugar, and that's U.S. measure. So we don't do weight in the U.S. We do volume. So that's um, dry measure. Now I'm going to add a few other ingredients. The next ingredient, ingredient is malic acid. Now different acids give different mouthfeels. Malic acid kind of gives a berry-like flavor. And I think this needs a little bit of rounded berry-like flavor. It doesn't really need the crispness of a um, citrus or citric acid but it does need a roundness and that's normally what you get from malic acid that's that's the acid that's normally found in berries and apples so if you want things to have more of an apple or berry flavor use malic acid whereas citric acid will just be very bright now I don't I don't want it to be bright it's already bright enough but I want it to have a little bit of more roundedness Okay, so I put one U.S. teaspoon of malic acid 
and my goodness that has improved the flavor dramatically now I'm going to add another ingredient tannin powder tannin powder is nothing more than most of the time they use hazelnut holes so it is a natural ingredient and it will give the tannins that you need so we're going to try that so I was actually reading the um, instructions that said that this is actually chestnut holes so um, I'm doing a quarter teaspoon at a time because you can definitely overdo this in a heartbeat so I'm just doing very very light measurements with this and um, but if you happen to have chestnuts or you happen to have hazelnuts or I mean you could even do pecan I would not use walnuts they they have a thing called juglon that causes anaphylaxis the nuts are safe to eat but I would not use the shell but chestnut shell could use pecan shell um, pecan shell probably do very well because they already have a lot of tannins in it but you can make your own use um, an electric uh, coffee grinder make your own powder Next, I'm going to add in a quarter of a teaspoon of black walnut. The black walnut just kind of gives a base flavor that's similar to the original Gallberry Honey. Gallberry Honey has kind of malty flavors, dark flavors, so I wanted to punch that up. And now I'm going to use some vanilla extract to bring in some floral notes. And I'm just going to use a quarter teaspoon of that. So I'm using very light amounts. I'm not trying to flavor this one or the other. I'm just trying to enhance what's already there. Alright, now I have four tablespoons of gallberry honey. I'm using Larry Gillies honey. He's from Florida. The gallberry honey is really not for it's going to provide a little bit of flavor it's not going to provide any more sweetness this is going to be my priming sugar you can use three you can use two but i would not use more than four i'm using four which is kind of pushing the cap on that but i want this to be really really uh carbonated without creating a bottle bomb and so based off of my calculations four is the max i feel comfortable with so I'm going to do four tablespoons of gallberry honey into this mix. I tell you what, this honey is just super thick, super viscous, and packed with flavor. Uh, I am a big fan of uh, gallberry honey now. For some reason, I just decided to take a taste test. I don't know why I did it, because once you add the honey in there, you're supposed to be pretty much done, but that honey, the extra sweetness brought out some flavors. I know the honey is going to ferment out. So I added um, some more erythritol. So now there's been 12 tablespoons of erythritol total added to this mixture. So I got my bottle in one in place with my bottles. I got my auto siphon up here. I've got a box I found to make it a little easier. I will say two things. One, the hoses that you buy on these kits are way, way, way too long. You need to trim them. Second of all, the size is usually smaller. So go up to a larger size hose because it takes forever just to get that barely on there. I don't know why they do these kits the way they do. They're not that great as far, it's not really a kit. They don't do the siphon and siphon hose and the bottle and wand right. They need to get it, they need to get their game down better. But I'm on, um, what you have to do is you have to press down on the bottle. So I've got to use both hands because I don't have help. So you have to 
press down because that has a stem valve right here on the bottom. If you don't press that stem valve, it's not going to start flowing. I'm going to bring it all the way up to right here. And then that will actually bring it to here when I take it out due to displacement. So I've got to use both hands to do this. I won't show you how it's done, but I gave, gave you an idea of my setup. The other thing I'll say, these, um, these siphons have a cap on the top to um, help prevent getting leaves sucked up into the siphon. You gotta take that off when you do this. You see it just coming right on up. And then once it gets to the top, I'll lift up, which is right about now. There we go. Okay, so this actually made nine bottles, but one of the bottles I wasn't paying attention. What I was doing, it fell and poured out, so I lost that bottle. So nine bottles out of a gallon isn't bad of beer bottles. Now we cap them. Okay, so what I've got here is just a bag so I can keep these separate because the contest requires that I not have any special markings for the bottles and I have to submit three bottles. So the rest of these bad boys I have marked as Hydromel. And um, I'll do one for a tasting and then I'm gonna give away some to some people that I know. But I marked this on the bag so that I can keep them separated. And I've got Hydromel, it's a sparkling Hydromel. I started at 513, I bottled it 62, and it has an ABV of approximately 4.5% alcohol. So that's counting in um, the sugars that I added from the honey and the fact that I added in some other stuff that changed the volume. So it's anywhere between three and a half and four and a half. If you can tell a difference of 1% alcohol, eh, you're better than I am. So this is definitely a low ABV, which is the definition of a hydromel is honey and water at a low ABV. And so now I'm just gonna put these away and we'll go from there. All right, so it's been a while now um, that contest was entered. Uh, now it's time to actually taste this. And it was, it was a little over carbonated. Uh, I, I need, I'm, I've switched up how I do the carbonation. I would recommend using carbonation drops. In fact, that's what I'm gonna be doing for the rest of this series is use the carbonation drops exclusively um, so that you know what you got. And uh, I've also made sure that where I've got my brew stored, that it's around 72 to 74 degrees. Why is that? Because the, where I had it, it was like 68 to 65 degrees. The beer was not fermenting quickly enough to produce fizz and so you don't want to create a bottle bomb with that said let's try this and so it's it's a little cloudy I'll admit it but that's because I, I didn't um, I didn't uh, clarify it like I was just doing it very quickly you could take your time and rack it a little bit better and get something clear but really and truly Professional meteries, they have cloudy brews all the time. It is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just an aesthetics issue. And our ancestors definitely didn't care if it was cloudy. Um, it's only something that as of recently, clarity matters. And too much emphasis is put on clarity. What we need to do is instead look at the taste. Um, first, what we always do is smell it because tasting starts with your nose. So 
I smell the honey, but I also smell those beer notes. And that's what you should have with a gallberry honey. It should smell reminiscent of beer. So because it's malty and chocolatey and it's got all those bitter notes and all those different funky little notes that you get in beer, gallberry honey provides that. It's got a fairly decent head and I'm seeing bubbles all throughout this so it's heavily carbonated. Let's give it a try. Mm. Mm. Wow. That, just that first sip, that's a powerful drink. I mean, it's a low ABV. I mean, it's beer level. Let's face it, it's beer level. But you feel like you're drinking a beer. You, you know, there's a myth that Vikings, that that's what they regularly drank. It's not really true. Go to my Blound video. Um, that Blound video is a whey drink that I made into a mead and I, I dispel some of the myths about Vikings and mead uh, but this right here you can you could think of your ancestors your forefathers getting one of these and drinking it it drinks like a good beer wow slightly sweet not too sweet but it's got that beer flavor and that's from the gallberry honey the gallberry honey is on the forefront and I think that's where a lot of people they don't appreciate the honey enough you need to respect the honey so if you make this with Tupelo honey you're not going to get those beer notes that you're going to get with gallberry honey but you'll get something that you need to know what it tastes like and so I always recommend whatever base honey you use the hydra male just the plain hydra male do that first because that's going to give you the cleanest most natural flavor of the fermented honey because things taste differently when fermented than when they're not fermented so you can taste the honey and go wow okay whatever it's honey you know it's this or it's that and you, you may or may not taste all the nuanced flavors or there may be flavors that develop after fermentation or they may be flavors that are muted after fermentation and so you need to know what the end product is going to taste like fermented. And so on this, I now know what the base is. Of course, I've already had some before, so I know what it tastes like. But this is something that actually tastes better now because I've aged it, because I've drank a few of these already. And then I sent it off to the judges. So letting it sit two, three, four months will help. I wouldn't go much more than six months though because it's a low ABV and the lower your alcohol by volume your ABV the less time it can store and then it starts going downhill but I would say up to six months you can store this for maximum flavor and this has been this is set for about two to three months now so it's really really good Um, flavors have melted and thing about it is as you change your time so you, you expand your time out flavors are always compounds are being broken down and recreated and new compounds created and broken down as time progresses so just because you bottle something doesn't mean that the fermentation process has stopped you can add all the chemicals you want to. You can add heat and all that stuff. In fact, adding heat, what people recommend for pasteurization of your brews because they think that's more natural. That, over time, will create a different flavor profile 
than say a one that somebody used chemicals so potassium sorbate um, potassium metabisorphate uh, Camden tablets all that it, putting those chemicals in there you'll get a different flavor profile than if you just let it sit naturally or you cap out the yeast and sweeten it so for instance if we were not doing a sparkling beer or not beer but mead and we were just doing a regular mead you could do one and you might want to do this go ahead and take it and do one where you pasteurize it and that's where you just leave the cap off of it um, put a, a piece of tin foil over it and stick a thermometer um, in in that that tin foil where it's in that liquid and put it in a pot of water and bring it up to where the core temp of that bottle gets up to about 140 for so many seconds about 20 to 30 seconds something like that no more than a minute and that will kill the yeast and you can do that and see how it tastes versus putting some potassium sorbate and potassium metabisorbate or um, Camden tablets whatever and putting that in there and then do another bottle and doing then do another bottle where you have fermented it past the the yeast tolerance and then sweetened and just let it be natural you'll find out that just letting it do it that the natural way where you cap out your yeast even though you're going to have a higher alcohol that the flavors will be drastically different and far more complex than some of the newer ways so something to try um, and of course with this you can't really do it because you're you could you could pasteurize um, you have to be careful how you pasteurize there are some youtubers have some great videos that you can watch on how to do it um, you have to be careful you can have bottle bombs you can have things erupt when you try pasteurize something that has been carbonated and then you're adding heat but you could do that um, you really can't use chemicals and pasteurize it after you bottle condition or bottle ferment but the flavors are still going to be drastically different this right here this is a fantastic brew I mean if I was mowing grass you know right now it's over a hundred degrees um, here in Florida uh, 10 a.m. one day it was 103 degrees already with a heat index that was far beyond that and by midday it was almost 107 degrees um, with a heat index that was tipping close to 120 degrees that's hot and you walk outside and you're just pouring sweat and so when you come in you drink water and you almost get sick so a lot of people in Florida they'll want something like a beer and it's almost nourishing to the body if you was out cutting grass in that heat this right here would give you what you needed you it would give you what you wanted it does have just a residual sweetness it's got that bitterness that you would expect from hops but there's no hops in it that is all from the gallberry honey so I recommend that you try this follow along with me try these meads out see what I'm talking about I mean if you're gonna be doing this anyway you're gonna spend hundreds of dollars anyway why not learn how to do it a very quick way a very inexpensive way learn and experiment on something that not less quality but it's definitely cheaper faster more expendable if you make a mistake try that I think that's the smarter way to learn than putting what 30 40 dollars 
into your high dollar honeys and wine yeasts and your fermenters and those special airlocks that everybody wants to use and you're doing all this stuff and then you find out that your brew was garbage because there was something you didn't know about what you needed to do. At least with this, you know, gallberry honey is running about six dollars a pound. I'm only using a pound. Uh, I'm using, if I use a juice, it's straight from the store. I'm not using anything special. I'm not using organic juice or anything of that nature. So you can at least get something that's affordable and say, okay, I know this is probably not the best ingredients. This is probably, even my airlock, I use a balloon. Good grief, you saw that. So you can say, okay, a balloon is cheap. A balloon is easy, it's disposable. I think I paid 90 something cent, almost a dollar at Walmart for like 30 something balloons. Good grief. That's going to one packet of balloons cover you. And then you only got one packet of yeast that you're going to need to use for all these brews. So you're not having to buy wine yeast. You're not having to buy ale yeast or anything special. I didn't use anything really that special with any of these and I'm getting phenomenal flavors. And so you can learn, say, okay, I need to do this, I need to do that, whatever. And if you make a mistake, okay, it's not that big of a deal. Not like if you spent, you know, $30, $40 on something. Now, that's something to be concerned about. But if you spend five, six, seven, eight dollars I mean, good grief, now a sandwich at a fast food restaurant costs you $13. And it's not going to be more enjoyable than this beverage here. Let me tell you that. And I get about seven to eight bottles out of a gallon depending on the brew, the sediment, and everything else. So you think about that. Seven to eight bottles, that's not bad. I looked for beer the other day in store and it was $16 for six beers. I get more than that and my stuff tastes a lot better and is a lot more innovative. So follow along with me. Give this a try. I think you'll be glad you did and you might even learn something. So if you haven't already, hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that notification bell and I'll see you again next time. Bye.